Uh, thanks, Kelsey. So as he said, my name is Jake Mashenko. I'm the product tech lead for Quay.io here at CoreOS. Uh, and with me today is Joey Shore. He's a senior software engineer on the Quay.io product as well. So we mostly work out of New York. So this San Francisco thing is newer to us. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to quickly go over what Quay.io is. Quick show of hands, does anybody know it? People use it? Yeah? Uh, all the CoreOS people are downstairs, so that's 40 plants that are missing. But So just a quick re recap, Quay.io is a container registry similar to the Docker Hub. Um, and what we do is we basically offer push-pull, index, search capabilities, and a bunch of other really cool stuff that I highly encourage you to go check out. Um, we're also available on-prem today, so if you need a container registry behind your firewall and available to you. We are a, a solution that you should definitely take a look at. Um, as Alex alluded to earlier, we launched a bunch of cool new stuff today. So we launched a brand new UI. Um, if you go, it should be live. You should see it immediately. We launched a feature called Time Machine, which allows you to roll back uh, tag manipulations. So if you move your latest tag onto a different image, from where it was before, you can go and you can roll that back, and that gives you uh, auditability and the ability to recover from a bad push, which is like our worst nightmare as devs. We offer a drastically improved search, so we, we take into consideration how popular the repository is and how close it is to you in your network. Uh, so the search should go from our least used feature to our most used feature overnight. And we added Bitbucket and GitLab support for building, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But I just want to point out that all of these news features are not actually the point of my talk. So this talk is going to be a deep dive onto how we actually build uh, your container images from your Git pushes. So quick show of hand, who here uses Docker or Docker files? About half. Uh, who uses any form of continuous integration? We should get that number a little bit higher. Uh, who uses Quay? Not just heard of it, but who actually uses it? Okay, we should also get that number higher. And uh, who, does anybody use our Dockerfile build capability on Quay? All right, Frank, number one, <laughs> number one customer in the room. All right, uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about why transforming your Git commits into Docker images that you can pull is a hard problem and how we accomplish it. So first, a quick note on, uh, continuous integration itself. So basically what you're doing is every time you do a push to your source control solution, which I'm absolutely sure everybody in this room is using that, so there was no reason to ask. We're going to basically take uh, your, your git push and some metadata that you've included with that git push, such as a Docker file or specific Quay instructions, and we're gonna turn around and turn those, convert those into a Docker image that you can pull. Um, so this is an example repository. This is the etcd repository that's attached to our build system. Um, as you can see, there have been several pushes that have triggered builds, and they were all successful, so we're very happy to see that. Um, if you click on any one of these items, you can go into a, a log view where you can see more information about the build, more information about what triggered it, and then you can actually dig into the logs behind each individual Docker command. So I know it's very small, but uh, these commands over in the corner, or down in the middle, I'd say, are com specific commands that have been extracted from the Docker file and then run, and then we've aggregated those and then made them available to you through this UI. So here's an example of digging into the go wrapper install command. You can see that all of this information was written to standard error while it was building. So we really give you the tools to dig into what exactly happened about why your build was a success or failure. And that helps you debug and, and fix your problems more quickly. Um, so at its base, we're just transforming git commits to images, right? It's just docker build dot. So why is that even hard? Well, first of all, we're trying to do it safely, right? So we're going to run this on our servers, so it has to be safe. We have to make sure that giving you control to run code does not uh, cause any exploits. And we also want to completely accurately preserve the semantics of a local build. So what that means is anytime you run Docker build on your local machine and it succeeds and the same build fails in Quay, we've failed and we need to improve our system in some way. So at its heart, um, this whole workflow is going to be kicked off by basically a git commit and a push. 
And I'm going to drop into these sort of simulated terminal commands from time to time. And what these are are just a local version of how you would do on your own machine what we're doing up in the cloud. So in this case, we do a commit. Here, I've, I've created the, uh, the greatest commit of all time. But it's actually just a tribute to the greatest commit of all time, because there's you know, no actual code here. So. Uh, and then this is how, what at the push is what's actually going to trigger the build and deploy cycle. So whenever you push, we have integrated with the various different software configuration management providers, such as GitHub, brand new today, Bitbucket, and GitLab. Um, if you install the build trigger through one of our supported providers, we actually do all of the work to set it up for you. So we install a deploy key, we set up the webhook properly, we make sure that it validates with the SEM provider. Um, but if you want to do any of this stuff manually with your own Git repository, you can, right? So we have instructions on how to set up webhooks and send a manual payload to trigger a build on our system and pull it from your own repository, wherever that may be. Uh, and then the thing that kicks this all off is that we actually receive a webhook from the SEM provider, right? So in this case, GitHub goes to us, hey, Quay, uh, your user just did a new push, and here's a new SHA. I think you should go build it. And since Quay runs in Docker, we have Docker on the box. All we have to do is we have to turn around and say Docker build, and we're done. So this concludes my talk. Uh, you guys have been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, actually, we can't just do that, right? So we can't run untrusted user code on our app servers, even though they already have Docker, even though they already have all the information required to build it. And the reason we can't do this is because security, obviously. Right? So Docker builds by default, build as root, or not by default, there's no way around it. Um, container escapes are real, so when you run something as root inside the container, any syscall which you can access, which hasn't been properly masked off, is a container escape, and it's something that you could uh, use to take control of our machines nefariously. So basically, once any user code gets run on any machine, we have to consider it as completely untrusted which means that we have to sanitize any data that comes off of it, just like you have to do with any code that you get from a user or any you know, SQL sanitization, all this stuff. Users are evil, don't trust them, right? So that's what we have to do. Um, and then we have to make sure that we never reuse that machine. We don't want to give it any more secrets. So if like company A takes control of the machine and does something nefarious, we have to make sure that we don't give it company's B, company B's data, because that's obviously a horrible situation. They could turn around and send that code wherever they wanted. So, these are all things to avoid, and all of the things that led us to choosing the infrastructure that we chose. So here, who here knows what user namespaces are? Linux user namespaces. That's about right. Um, and who here thinks that Linux user namespaces are a panacea for all kinds of container escapes? OK. Well, you guys are uh, a very non-trusting crowd, which is good, I guess. So user namespaces actually do eliminate the known container escapes. And they do this by translating UID 0, which is root to the Linux kernel. Inside the container, UID 0 gets mapped to a much higher UID outside of the container, and then gets subject to all of the other uh, user limitations that uh, any normal user on Linux would have outside the container. So we actually ran a fork of Docker with user namespaces uh, kludged in for about a year. It worked really well, it was really fast, um, but our users were unhappy because we had violated one of the, the core principles that we were going for, and that was to completely replicate the local build experience in the cloud. So for example, certain um, distro packages have to run install scripts when you, inst like apt-get install or yum install a package, and some of those install scripts right, may run, for example, the make node command. So as of the time of this writing, there is no way to run the make node command as non-root user, as, as in not truly UID 0. The Linux kernel just doesn't allow it. So any of those packages would fail. Um, another thing, when you define a user namespace, you have to define a range which the user IDs will map to. So for example, if you say, I'm just going to uh, shift all UIDs up 100,000, and I'm going to define a range of 100,000. That means that inside the container, UID 0 to 100,000 will map to 100 to 200,000 outside the container. Uh, this is desirable, but unfortunately, we had users who somehow thought 100,000 UIDs was not enough to work with. Uh, for, as a concrete example, they had TARs, like tar, uh, TAR archives, 
that had headers which referenced a numerical UID 200,000, which just couldn't be extracted under this situation because it was like there's no UID 200,000 that I can use. So that was obviously a problem, and it again broke the, the user expectation. Finally, even if you get everything inside the container to work and be trusted, some things happen outside the container. So who here remembers when GitHub exposed a CVE around Git pull? OK, it happened. Uh, so there was also a pair of CVEs for Docker pull. So if you did a, a Docker pull, it would call an executable that was outside of the container. But unpacking the tar itself could overwrite that executable. Instant uh, privilege escalation, root exploit on the box. So even if we could completely secure everything that happens within the container, we still have to make sure that uh, everything that happens outside the container has no ability to compromise our system. So some of you may be asking, well, if the problem is that things that get run inside the containers could potentially mess with the machines, why can't we just wipe the machines to a clean known state? So who here thinks that they can reliably wipe a machine to a clean state after users running their own code on it? I see we're getting the hang of this. Uh, a couple people do. Uh, you can reboot it with constraints. With constraints, yep. So basically, this falls into the trap of the trusted client problem. So it's true that we could reboot it with constraints, and that's what Secure Boot is aiming to do, and that's something that we have landing in CoreOS soon and on AWS later. Uh, but basically, before you have help from your infrastructure provider, any signal that you sent to the machine could be intercepted by a nefarious process. And it could say, like, oh, yeah, you want me to reboot? Yeah, I totally just rebooted. Send me some more data. Right? So we try and avoid uh, having to, to try and close down any kind of those, those problems or those escalations or those exploits. Um, and then another possibility that we looked at was just using our infrastructure as a service provider to do a control plane reboot. And this is, we would basically tell EC2, go reboot that box. And EC2 would reliably say, yeah, I'll reboot that box, and I can even switch out the, the drive for a clean one, which would be great. But unfortunately, they give us no incentive to actually do that. Because of the way billing works, they charge you for a whole new hour as soon as you reboot that box, even if it's the same one. Some, some providers have incentives, and some providers have minute-by-minute uh, minute billing, which is also a, a big boon. Um, so basically, we're going to use a new machine each time. Um, virtual machines are ideal for this kind of workload because they have a quick start time. The marginal cost is very low to actually bring up a, a virtual machine. It happens very quickly. Um, unfortunately, it's not really doable on any of the already virtualized infrastructure as a service providers. Um, this is possible with uh, KVM hardware virtualization extensions, but it's still not in production in any of the cloud providers. So basically, we said, fine. It's too hard to do virtual machines. It's too slow to do it completely in software. We're just going to let the cloud provider do all the virtualization. So we just bring up a new machine each time. It should come as no surprise to anybody in this room that we bring up CoreOS on those machines. And the reason we chose CoreOS is because, one, we are CoreOS. And two, it's a lightweight, quickly booting, and it's preloaded with Docker. So it has a lot of the, the prerequisites that we would need from, any, uh, from this OS that's going to run in this ephemeral new machine all the time manner. So it was kind of a no-brainer to pick CoreOS, uh, pretty quick to get up and running. So again, this is a, a local equivalent to what we're doing in the cloud. But if any of you guys use Vagrant, basically we're just saying, go to a, a CoreOS machine definition, and then bring up a new machine that has that definition. And then we have to log into that machine. So what does it mean to log into the machine in the cloud? So we have this, this concept of a build manager. And the build manager is responsible for puppeting these machines and seeding the data that they have to start with. Uh, earlier, we talked a little bit about cloud config and what that does. But cloud config is a way for you to initialize your machines and get them running with a, a certain set of services and data. I've obviously truncated it here. But basically, this is two steps that the build manager is performing. First, the build manager asks Quay, hey, do you have a new build for me? And Quay may say, no, come back later. Or it may say, yeah, here, here's a, a definition of a build that I think you should go do. And if there is a build available, if there is something that it needs to go do, it'll turn around and it'll start a machine. And on that machine, it will put a secure token. 
Later on, that machine will use the secure token to talk to the build manager, to authenticate with the build manager. This is the cloud equivalent of logging into that machine. And then it will be given the different parameters that it needs to do the build. Uh, right. So this is that step where later on the build worker, once it's finally ready, once the machine comes up and once our processes start, it turns around and it asks the manager, hey, how about that build that you, you started me for? Right? I exist. I must exist because there's a build. How, give me the build now. And this is great because we have one and exactly one build manager for all of the Quay build infrastructure. So it's kind of perfect. Um, no, that's not right. We actually have a multitude of build managers. And this is because we want our build managers to be high availability, like any other uh, different component in your system. So we don't want the build managers to end up being a single point of failure. We also don't want their, their, the necessity for the build manager to track a specific machine to inhibit our ability to upgrade our fleet, to do a rolling upgrade, to inhibit the ability to upgrade those build managers. And we also want the ability to migrate any running build to a new build manager. Um, so now we have the question of how do we actually make these build managers symmetric in such a way that any build can be requested from any build manager? So it should come as no surprise to anyone in this room that we use our own distributed database for that. Uh, it's our distributed data store of choice because we have, you know, it is us, again, we have influence over its implementation. And it uses the Raft algorithm, which is simple to understand and easier to implement. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about etcd, there's a couple talks this afternoon. There's one about how to make Postgres HA using etcd, and that's at 3. And there's another introduction to Raft from the actual Raft creator, and that's at 5.10 today. Um, so now, when the build manager spawns a new machine and it generates that token, we turn around and we write that token into etcd. etcd turns around and writes that same token into all of the other build managers. This is what actually makes them symmetric. So now when a build worker comes to a build manager and it says, hey, I've got this token. Do you have a build for me? Literally any build manager can turn around and give it the information that it needs. Uh, this was a big boon to our, the stability of our infrastructure and the stability of our build manager fleet. Once the token is exchanged, we invalidate it in etcd so that no, there's, there can be no replay attacks with another new machine intercepting that token and trying to use it to get another uh, build manager to give it work. Once, it's a, uh, once the token has been exchanged, we establish a bidirectional RPC and pub sub channel that we can use to send commands back and forth between the worker and the manager and also to stream out some of the information that's happening when we actually perform the build. And with that, I'd like to transition over to Joey, software engineer on Quay, who's going to tell us a little bit more about how the actual build happens. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Joey. I'm a software engineer on Quay. Um, so we've seen how we set up all the infrastructure to run our build workers and have them speak to the build manager. I'm going to dive a bit now into how the build worker itself performs the build job, um, some of the optimizations we've put in place there, and uh, how the build manager uh, handles the data coming out. So building an image in Docker is actually fairly simple. We have to get the code onto the build worker, the contents of the Git repo at the commit shop. Um, priming the cache allows for faster builds. This isn't strictly necessary, but it's a good optimization to do. We, of course, build the image, and then we have to push the built image to uh, Quay itself. So just a little bit of background on how we got the code onto the build workers. Previously, we would download an archive by SHA from GitHub. Um, unfortunately, this had a few problems. Uh, for one, it only worked on GitHub, which wasn't a problem until today, but now we're supporting Bitbucket, GitLab, and custom Git, so it wouldn't work. Um, a bigger problem was that it didn't have a .git directory. So it was, in fact, just a static file set of the contents of, the, of Git at that SHA. Uh, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of people were using um, the Git directory's information to execute commands including the git rev parse command you see on the slide. Uh, that would fail because there was no git directory. It also didn't allow for submodules, which get their information from the .git directory amongst other locations. And that would be a problem for teams that made heavy use of submodules. So to solve this problem, starting today, we're doing a full clone. And that gives you the full .git information. 
Um, we actually don't have to do a full clone because we're looking for a specific SHA that was triggered fairly recently. So we at first tried to do a shallow clone to a small depth and then look for the SHA in there. If that fails, we then do fall back to a deep clone. Uh, this is just more of an optimization, but we now have the full .git directory contents. So uh, you can see here, this is roughly the order of work we execute when we do the uh, clone. First, we export the deploy key as the git SSH key. Uh, this key is automatically installed into the git repo if you're using one of our providers, and if you're doing it by hand, we give you the key to install itself. We then do the clone itself. That gets us all the contents. We check out the specific SHA. And then finally, we do a recursive download of all the submodules for that repository. If there aren't any, this step just no ops out, um, so we run it every time. Um, this is, as I said, roughly equivalent, but it's pretty much the order we run it, except we do it via um, a library call. Uh, a note about caching. So I mentioned earlier that caching isn't strictly necessary, but is very beneficial. Um, Docker supports caching on builds when run locally. It keeps the local cache information on disk. Unfortunately, as Jake alluded to earlier, we have these ephemeral build nodes for security. And we can't have your full image history information on the build node without downloading the entire repository, which would be, frankly, ridiculous. Um, so in order to get the benefits of caching without the downsides, um, we re actually replicate the cache query that Docker performs from the Docker build code path, but we do it recursively and we do it on our own servers remotely. Um, we do this to find the best tag that we can use for caching, and then we pull that best fit tag to the build worker before the build begins. So I'm going to go briefly into how we actually do that. Um, to start, we pull down the base image referenced in the Docker file. This gives us a point of um, derivation from which we can find the, the closest fit caching tag. And then we do a search to find the closest tag and pull that to the machine. As an example, you can see here um, an example Docker file on your left and an equivalent tree representing the repository that's being built on the right. Um, and I'll just briefly walk through how we do this cache matching algorithm. So first, as I said, we pull the base image, in this case Ubuntu latest, and we pull that down onto the build node because it's going to be needed for the build anyway. We then use that image ID, look it up in the repository, and we find it as the root of the caching tree. If it doesn't exist, then we know there's no caching. We can see here we found two branches possible. And then we walk each step of the Docker file, matching commands, until we reach a point where it diverges. Now in this instance, you can see that the branch on the right has been dropped, not just because the command doesn't match, which it does, but because the contents of the directory that's being added do not match. And we actually do the full hash calculation that Docker would perform. And we do this on the build worker and send the hash over to the client so that we can find the proper branch. So in this case, we've seen it found the left branch because that hash matches the file contents. Then we check the final command and we see that we found this tag, v3, and that is the best fit tag for caching. Um, this happens very quickly because we can actually walk the branches in the database. And we actually will walk every branch that we can find to so see we can fi find the closest match to your build, give you the maximum cache re caching reusability on each build. Finally, once we have the caching information pulled to your node, we execute the build. Fairly simple. We tag it with the name of your repository. And then once the build completes, we push it. All of this occurs over the local Docker socket in the um, build worker, which is itself a Docker image. Um, now, this is fairly simple, but of course, this doesn't get us any information about how the build is occurring and in real time. To do that, we actually stream logs out of Docker via the socket and send those to the build manager which then semantically processes and aggregates them. We have these logs go over the pub sub channel to the build manager, again, for security reasons, so that there's no direct communication between the build worker and any of the rest of our infrastructure. The build manager is solely in charge. Finally, once the build is finished, we push the results directly to Quay using an access token. And then if we write the completion status over the same pub sub channel to the build manager. Now, once we're done with machine, we can't trust it anymore. That machine could be completely hosed at that point. It could be completely tainted. We don't know. So we use our infrastructure as a service provider's out-of-band channel to forcibly shut down that machine, and now we don't have to worry about it from any security perspective anymore. 
So that's a brief overview of how we conduct the actual build, and I'm going to transition it back to Jake, who will give some more information of, about the interesting features that result of having this continuous build process. Thanks. Uh, so one thing, one last thing to point out on this slide is that um, even though that machine still has a token, because that token has been invalidated, even if the machine somehow finds a way to stay alive, we'll never give it any more data until it eventually gets cleaned up later on. So as a bonus, once we're done building your code, uh, you might actually want to do something with that image. You might actually want to get it on some machines. So of course you can do a Docker pull, like anybody would with one of these images. And that's just a standard pull. We, we give you all of the images or the calculated delta if you've got uh, some of the images already available on your production machines. But we also have a couple other interesting ways to get the code on your machines or to get the built image on your machine. The first one is that we can actually squash your image. So if you know the way that Docker images are comprised of layers, you know that even if you delete files from a layer, for example, those files are still present in a layer that's further down. Um, additionally, the registry protocol itself is somewhat chatty. So pulling this information down can actually take kind of a long time just because of the number of round trips required. So basically what we do is we, we turn this into a single tarball that represents the, the whole Docker repository as a single layer. For, and for efficiency reasons, we cache that and we stream it out to you as we're creating it. Um, so this can be very, very, very beneficial if you're trying to deploy the same single repository. You're not reusing any of the cache information that we've tried so desperately to preserve, but you're trying to get this code onto a lot of ephemeral machines very quickly. Uh, this would be one way to do it. This is how we ourselves deploy to production. Um, additionally, it should come as no surprise to anybody in this room that we are supporting Rocket where possible, Rocket and uh, AppC. So I'm sure by this point it's completely unnecessary to mention, but Rocket is not AppC, and AppC is not Rocket. So AppC is the app container spec, uh, and specifically ACI is the image format for the app container spec. So what we're doing is when we want to create a Rocket compatible image, all we're doing is adhering to the ACI spec and streaming that information out that way. Um, so we actually support the rocket fetch command. We have all of the metadata tags in place on Quay.io. So if you do a rocket fetch, first you have to do a rocket trust because rocket uh, takes trust very seriously. So you have to put our signing key into your local trust tree. But if you do a rocket trust and then a rocket fetch, we will create a specialized version of that squashed image that we generated for Docker where we also translate all of the metadata over to the ACI format. And that includes everything that we can think of. That includes the environment variables, the run command, uh, any of the isolators that we know how to translate. So it's hmm? volumes. Docker volumes, yep. So we, we make a best effort to faithfully translate that over to the ACI format. And then once that's all done and pulled, you can rocket run that image. Um, and that's all I have. So we have about five, three minutes for <laughs> question and answer. And we'll also be holding Quay.io office hours today from 2.20 to 2.50 up in the CoreOS office hours rooms if you have any longer form questions. So questions, anybody? Front row. Uh, if you, I'll repeat it if okay. we don't want to. Tell us about the bi-directional RPC and pub sub. What's the deal with that? Is it a private thing? Did you use some toolkit? OK. Um, so right now, the question, oh, well, he had a mic, so you heard it. So the question is, how do we actually establish the bi-directional pub sub channel here? Uh, so currently today, we're using WAMP, which is a WebSocket protocol for uh, establishing these kind of RPCs and these, the pub sub channel. We're looking to move off of WAMP because they've recently made a breaking change that we're not necessarily in agreement with. We're probably considering moving over to gRPC uh, when it's ready. So the question was, what about testing? And I think Joey wants to answer it. Yeah. Um, so right now, we actually um, recommend to the customers to either A, do testing outside of the build process, or if the test tests primarily have unit tests, you can actually run the unit tests as part of the Dockerfile build process itself. 
So we ourselves, as part of our build, have a few run lines that run our unit tests as part of the image construction. And that way, we're never building and pushing a broken image. Now, this obviously doesn't handle integration testing. Um, and we're looking into efforts about building out support for being able to do integration testing as well. But re our recommendations right now is either do unit tests in the Dockerfile build itself and or use an existing testing inf infrastructure to do tests out of band. And you can actually set up the webhook so that your out of band testing system can kick off a build with us after the test is complete. Or our build can fire a webhook on a successful push, and then your uh, continuous integration system can pick it up and go from there with the built image. And then even re tag it at that point. Okay, I think one more. Or we're good. All right. All right. Uh, oh, okay, one more. Uh, so the question was about, uh, we currently translate Docker engines to ACI, and what about the reverse process? So that's actually on our roadmap. Um, the big questions right now are about how to get ACIs to a registry. I myself am actually going to be working on um, updates to the spec in the next couple weeks on how we can propose ways to upload ACIs to a compliant endpoint. Once we have support for doing that in Quay, which will happen soon after that, we're going to add the ability to Docker pull any ACI image pushed up to Quay so that you can truly have bi-directional support. So you're, it's essentially container format agnostic. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. And again, office hours at 220 to 250.